Hello, everybody. Just want you to take the time today to wish you and your family a very happy 4th of July. I hope everyone's having a good time watching some fireworks and uh, really enjoying a safe celebration. But I wanted to take a little bit of a big picture look today. Not talking about any one specific news story, but talk about America, because that is what the 4th of July is all about. It's the day that our uh, our long-held ideals were put to the test. The Founding Fathers said to Britain, stick it, you know, all the way. All those years ago, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was signed and released to the public. So, yeah, very, very exciting stuff and a very, very cool time in history. Uh, of course, there's a lot of other things going on, but I do want to take a look at what we did after, and a big part of what we did after comes in the formation of our military, which really, if you think about it, has turned into a dominating cultural force in American life, as respect and admiration for the military is one of the central tenets of American life. From a young age, American children are about to show a certain reverence for the military. The outpouring of appreciation towards those who fought for our freedom is perfectly natural. There is no better indication of the worth of a country than how it treats those who have been sent to die for it. The truth is, however, that life was not always this way. The United States first authorized the creation of the military in it, the first ever session of the new Congress in 1787, but the financially poor nation relied heavily on independent militias for collective defense. Our military would only really expand in size when involved in a major war, but when that war ended, the troops would simply be sent back home until we needed volunteers for the next war. But after the Second World War, everything changed. U.S. military spending ballooned for the war and never went back down again. From that point on, certain people began to realize that there was a lot of money in defense. Slowly, the noble cause of defending one's country from people who wished to see it destroyed turned into an industry of death and destruction. In the years after the Second World War, our attention turned from self-protection to global domination, and the military was used as a tool to achieve that goal. The United States military, for that reason, has caused more harm than good in the post-World War II period through interventions and interference with intentions of global domination in Latin America, Asia, and the Middle East. The Founding Fathers would have preferred our military in this pre-World War II way. That's the funny part about it. Average Americans stepping up to defend their fellow countrymen. They were stringently opposed to a standing army. The famously Federalist James Madison said to the military, that means the means of defense against foreign danger have always been the instruments of tyranny at home. Among the Romans, it was a standing maxim to excite war whenever revolt was apprehended. Throughout all Europe, the armies kept up under the pretext of of defending have enslaved the people. Samuel Adams wrote in 1776, such a professional army always uh, was always dangerous to the liberties of the people. And if we were to resuscitate the Founding Fathers today, imagine their shock at a military budget of $686.1 billion. That's how much we spend today in times of peace. That's absolutely unprecedented anywhere else in the world. The question is, why so much money for defense? Sure, it's great to have some money set aside to protect your own people, but in the increasingly stable international order, is it really necessary to have a bigger budget than the next seven countries combined, six of which we have very good relationships with? So what did we do with all that money? We asserted global dominance in some of the poorest regions of the world, many times in areas that were still struggling to gain a footing after years of colonial rule. One of the biggest areas where this took place was Latin America. Things kicked off when the then Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Teddy Roosevelt, helped to start the Spanish-American War while his boss was out to lunch. And then, as president, using the military to support an uprising in Panama that assured the U.S. rights to lucrative Panama Canal for many years to come. From there, the list goes on and on. In 1990, uh, 1944, the Guatemala dictator Jorge Ubico was overthrown and a democratic, democratically elected leader was inaugurated in his wake. You would think the proudly democratic America would welcome this development, but the problem was the United Fruit Company. The United Fruit Company was a very profitable American fruit company that controlled 42% in the land of Guatemala and was tax-exempt under the old regime, that is. Jacobo Arbenz, the now democratically elected leader of Guatemala, promised Decree 900, which distributed or redistributed large swaths of undeveloped land held by the wealthy few to landless farmers that made up 90% of 
of the population. In response, the U.S. organized a coup, reinstalling a military regime that lasted for the next 40 years in which 250,000 people were either killed or went missing. In the 70s, the United States overthrew a leftist, democratically elected Allende regime and brought in a hand-picked dictator, Augusto Pinochet, which they would support for decades to come. The Pinochet regime banned political parties, dissolved Congress, and scrapped the Constitution. He also censored the press, banned unions, permitted torture and repression, and, according to one government report, killed nearly 28,000 people during his rule. Volumes could and have been written on the history of U.S. interventions in Latin America alone, but some other countries the U.S. has been involved in include Cuba, Argentina, Nicaragua, Brazil, and Panama. Again, uh, the United States fundamentally changed the course of history of multiple countries, bringing continued unrest, violence, and poverty that they still feel to this day. And while this is a definitely a topic for another long, deep dive into a structural issue America faces, they still feel that unrest to this day, and it is a big part of what's fueling our current migrant crisis at the southern border. American military might was by no means exclusive to Latin America. Asia was one of the key areas where the U.S. looked to expand influence. In this continent, however, the actions of the U.S. were based almost exclusively uh, on interference on an ideological, explicitly anti-leftist level, not the kind of uh, capitalist uh, drive that we saw in Latin America with the United Fruit Company and other interests that occasionally propelled the U.S. to intervene in other countries. In this continent, the first real issue, the first big event that comes to mind post-World War II is obviously Vietnam. Like most leaders villainized by the U.S., Ho Chi Minh was initially friendly with us, appreciative of our efforts to repel the Japanese from our lands. But the thing most Vietnamese, men especially, wanted was independence from decades of either European or Japanese domination. While Roosevelt had no problem supporting self-determination for Vietnam, Truman was less passionate, and soon the French returned with men leading the anti-colonial armed resistance. The U.S. had one big problem with men's ascendant forces. They were not just explicitly left-wing, but also wanted nothing to do with anything representative of the West. The U.S. feared that one nation able to successfully expel Western influence and turn in a communist direction could lead to the entire nation falling to the Red Menace, and what we now know as a political doctrine and uh, national security doctrine called the Domino Effect. The French lost their attempt to regain complete control of Vietnam, and the country was divided up between communist North and pro-Western South. The leader of the South, No Dinh Diem, proved corrupt and authoritarian, but enjoyed complete U.S. support to the tune of nearly $2 billion in weapons and other aid. Soon, the brewing anim animosity between the North and South could not be contained, and an open, vicious conflict broke out between Diem and Minh. The U.S. gradually stepped up aid to the South until one day during what was originally portrayed as a routine patrol by the American destroyer ship the USS Maddox through the Gulf of Tonkin was interrupted by fire from North Vietnamese boats. When the truth came out, it was the USS Maddox that had shot first and was on a secret espionage mission, not a routine patrol. By that time, however, the draft had begun and 500,000 Americans were sent to the jungle. The toll of the war was devastating. Chemical weapons, including Agent Orange, were used by the U.S. Two million Vietnamese civilians were killed by the U.S. and Viet Cong in massive numbers, particularly in the village of Mai Lai, where the American Charlie Company killed 500 civilians, making a point of raping women before they killed them. All the while, America was being lied to by its own government. Our people were being lied to by the, its own government. The government knew the cause of victory in Vietnam was hopeless for years before the war was ended by an embarrassed Nixon on his way at the door, but still sent 50,000 plus their deaths and countless more suffered serious physical and mental injury in the wake of the fighting. The war was fought for a cause that had no effect on the lives of actual Americans, only for corporate profits. The war itself, however, destroyed the lives of millions. The cause would lead to destruction that would spread far past Vietnam, most notably in Indonesia, where the U.S. oversaw and supported the murder or disappearance of roughly one million leftists from leaders of the ruling Communist Party to low-level union workers. 
The genocide cleared the way for the rise of a right-wing military regime led by a dictator by the name of Suharto that coincidentally served all the U.S. interests in the region, not only stamping out con communism, but helping to expand its sphere of influence. It was a big, major win for the United States, written about in the wonderful new Vincent Bevan's book, The Jakarta Method. If you want to find more about that, do check it out. It's so kind of a interesting thing that we uh, kind of disappeared one million people in another country slash murdered them and no one really even talks about it. While it was definitely that, the U.S. looked to establish itself as a sole world superpower. It demanded total dominance and submission or total death and destruction. The most recent example of America attempting to show military dominance came roughly 30 years after the Vietnam War ended. Of course, there were other attempts, but none were as big as the Iraq War of 2003. In the wake of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the country was enraged, patriotic, and thirsty for revenge. The Bush administration was happy to answer the call, immediately starting a war against the Taliban terrorists in Afghanistan, and with that, the war on terror. Thanks to something called the authorization of use of military force, Bush was now unrestrained in his efforts to fight terrorism on a global scale. Hooray! By 2003, the Afghanistan war was going all right with the Bush administration, filled to the brim with some of the most pro-war thinkers the country had ever seen. Uh, those people in the Bush administration, they were bored with Afghanistan alone. They wanted to expand their ambitions to someone who they've been setting up as portraying as one of the biggest global villains that we have to deal with, Iraq and dictator Saddam Hussein. U.S. officials saw a prime target ripe for the takeover, softened up by years of brutal sanctions. While Saddam did many awful things through the course of regime, the U.S. decided to accuse him of probably the one thing he didn't actually do, which is pursue a nuclear weapons program. A nuclear Saddam that was possibly friends with Osama bin Laden was something the U.S. could not accept if they were at all serious about stopping global terrorism. It seemed like the perfect justification for war. The only problem was it wasn't a reality. Yet. In the words of Noam Chomsky, the U.S. had some consent to manufacture. They took a two-pronged approach to convincing the American public and international community that Saddam was the evil villain they all knew he was. They started by using intelligence from an Iraqi defector about nuclear tubes and something called mobile weapons of mass destruction systems or stations. They were warned by the Germans who were interviewing him for an asylum claim, the Iraqi defector, that most of his claims were likely BS. The U.S. didn't even talk to him before passing on that. And much of the information that turned out to be foundational for the case about weapons of mass destruction to senior policymakers, law enforcement, uh, uh, lawmakers, people in Congress, people high up in the American government. They also had weapons inspectors try and enter Iraq which Saddam um, well, welcomed, of course, because he didn't have any weapons. Uh, and he did, in fact, seem confused as to why the Americans seemed so convinced that he did. When they inevitably found nothing, senior Bush officials dismissed them as, quote, not looking hard enough. Meanwhile, they continued to lie and manipulate with the Justice Department official John Yu making the case the Fourth Amendment didn't even apply to the war on terror. And that Saddam had close ties to 9-11 terrorists all based off of the same intelligence that was barely looked at by officials, and ha they had been warned, again, they had been warned by multiple other countries that this intelligence was BS. Despite little backing from the international community and ignoring repeated warnings, the campaign in Iraq begun in 2002 with bombings and then aided by a helpful page in one New York Times story with more evidence that turned out to be fake a little bit later, about nuclear tombs Saddam had been attempting to purchase and a growing media consensus, the war began in full on March 20th, 2003. By its end, the U.S. had successfully killed Saddam and overthrew his regime, but in the process, we absolutely destroyed the country. After the war, there were 4 million people displaced and outside of Iraq, an average of about 100 people killed daily, and a third of the population living in poverty as well as unemployment being as high as 60%. It was even a years-long struggle to establish nationwide electricity to the relatively poor pre-war levels, as Iraq had been softened greatly again as a target of brutal U.S. sanctions that, while intending to weaken Saddam, only ended up strengthening his anti-American sentiment and the country. It is while inside of Iraq, innocent people, primarily children, starved and died. And, as we see again, for what? There was no reason to kill a million Iraqis, as we later found out. 
almost none of the government intel or official reporting was based in fact, so why did we get involved? That is the question that we must continue to ask ourselves when we do these things that continually turn out to be false or frauds. Why do we do this? Why are we pushed in this direction? I mean, when evaluating the history of American military, we really need to ask ourselves these questions. Mostly, the answer is the same people. Wealthy Americans, defense contractors, politicians, oil execs, all the expense of the lives of innocent people living their own life in another part of the world. It's becoming increasingly clear that the military's primary purpose isn't to defend Americans. It's been hijacked by some of the most powerful people in the world. It's to protect the American interest of the rich and powerful all over the world and by any means necessary. That is not, of course, an insult to any of the troops that serve. Uh, of course, the fact that I have to say that shows really the, the way things have gone. It's in kind of an indictment. What I'm trying to portray as is, of course, an indictment of the really toxic military-industrial complex and the drive, the death drive that so many people in charge of the military, uh, high, high up in our government, uh, the deep state, if you will, the the intelligence state, the national security community that we all hear so much about in today's news, those people driving the force are people that just have caused nothing but death and destruction the world over for decades now. And that should be a crucial part of how we look at our military. Just a little bit of uh, some reflection here on July 4th on really a pretty, pretty important and kind of... um, really structural systemic issue. Hope everyone again has a great July 4th, and I'm sure many people will disagree with me on what I'm trying to say here. Uh, So if you have some sort of response in the comments, I would be more than happy to hear it. Thank you so much for watching and listening to me on this national holiday.